Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining me tonight for the second episode of Something Dark. I bet you're wondering why I'm saying good evening um, tonight and this evening, so the only time that I can record this podcast with somewhat good acoustics is to do it in the dead of night. So it's currently 47 minutes past one in the morning. Last week I did also record in the evening time, but it was more like around 10 or 11 and my cat was awake and he was walking around and purring and meowing, so he's actually asleep at the minute too. So hopefully everything will be nice and quiet and there won't be too many interruptions. I want to say a big thank you to everybody for all of the amazing feedback on last week's episode. It means so much and I love hearing from everybody that they like the episode. You can always get in touch with me via Instagram. I'll leave the the link in the show notes. I have to say that I am enjoying getting all of my research together for the episodes and I'm learning a lot about how to use the microphone and the editing software. So I'm still getting better. It's still not going to be perfect, but I hope you will enjoy it. Um, Personally, I listen to podcasts while I'm at work. I have a job that I am able to listen to podcasts basically like eight or nine hours a day. So if I find a podcast that has loads of episodes, I will binge it and it'll get me through my working day. So hopefully I'm able to build up a nice long catalogue of episodes for you guys. Um, All that being said, I hope you enjoy tonight's episode. Tonight we're going to be discussing the case of Tina Herman and her two children and her friend Stephanie Sprang. This case occurred in 2010 in Ohio and... The murderer in this case that we're going to be discussing tonight is Matthew Hoffman. To understand more about this case, we need to go back in time to learn more about Matthew Hoffman and where he came from. Due to the lack of sources detailing him, not much information about Hoffman's early life has been revealed. He was born on November 1st, 1980, to his parents Robert and Patricia Hoffman. He grew up in the Warren area of northeastern Ohio, moving with his mother to Knox County in 1997 when his parents divorced. Neighbors would later describe his behavior as erratic and strange. According to one of them, he would kill squirrels and eat them. Others say he used to trap small animals in his yard, set small fires on the lawn, and sit in his trees in his garden. Alice Morelli, a former neighbor, recalled the teenage Matthew who lived next door to her in Trumbull County. He always appeared unhappy and acted strangely, she said. He was really lost. He was on a bad path. He and a friend got in trouble with the police in 1997, and when they were found on the roof of Lakeview High School, Hoffman said he just wanted to see if he could get up there. After moving to Apple Valley, he attended East Knox High School, graduating in 1999. He soon headed west, travelling to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and landed a job with a plumbing contractor. Then, the man with no rap sheet turned criminal. In a bid to cover up his 2000 burglary of a condo complex, he poured 10 gallons of gasoline and set the building ablaze. The fire sent 16 people running from their condos and caused $2 million in damage. Hoffman fled home to Knox County, where his mother and stepfather lived. But police suspected Hoffman in another crime as well. The theft of Welcome to the City signs. Hoffman agreed to return to clear up the matter. Police then arrested him and charged him with arson as well. Charles Feldman, who prosecuted the case, said that Hoffman struck him as someone who had a horrific appetite, 
a premeditated appetite to cause that kind of damage and the potential loss of life. Hoffman was sentenced to eight years in prison and served six. After his parole, he returned to Ohio in 2007, where he reported to local parole authorities. In the days ahead of his 30th birthday, not much was going right in Matthew Hoffman's already troubled life. He and his girlfriend, who accused him of choking her during an argument at home on October 24th, had broken up. She feared she might die. A few days later, he lost his part-time tree trimming job at Fast Eddie's after creeping at his supervisor and overselling his experience. Money was a constant concern. Besides the bills accompanying day-to-day -day life, he owed $2 million in restitution for setting fire to the condominium complex in Colorado. Even his dog had run away. But all that doesn't explain how this odd man became a suspect in a triple murder and the kidnapping of a 13-year-old girl. Criminologists say triggers such as job loss or the end of a relationship can ignite a buried fuse that burns into violence and even murder. Hoffman, who turned 30 on November 1st, had not gone out of his way to cultivate many friends over three decades. He basically kept to himself. A friend described him as intelligent, but without a lick of common sense. A man who was physically strong at six foot one, and 185 pounds, and imbued with a personality that embraced risk. On the evening of November 9th, 2010, Matthew Hoffman set himself up in his sleeping bag in the woods across from the home of 32-year-old Nina Herman and her two children, Cody and Sarah Maynard, who were 11 and 13. Sometime after 9 a.m. the next morning, after watching the house all night, Hoffman saw Tina Herman leave to take her kids to school. He snuck into the house through their overhead garage door, which hadn't closed entirely. According to his confession, he only ever intended to rob the house, but was surprised when Herman returned with her friend, Stephanie Sprang, when he had only been in the house for an hour. Despite his claims of having no plans to kill anyone, he did bring a knife with him to the house. It was described in police files as a serrated, jungle primitive knife that he'd bought online. He said he felt cornered, so he stabbed them both and began dismembering, or processing as he put it, their bodies in the bathtub. He was still in the process of doing this when the kids came home from school. Sarah ran up to her room. He then stabbed Cody, just feet from the front door. He caught Sarah and tied her up with a cord he'd taken from a fan and left her in the kitchen. It's assumed that she never saw the rest of the house, which police said looked like a scene from a horror movie. He then dismembered her brother, unloaded the body parts and his hostage into his Jeep Cherokee. Hoffman took Sarah back to his home, tied her hands and her feet with rope and duct tape her, and left her on a makeshift bed of leaves in his basement. He then left her alone for a while, as he took the body parts of his other three victims to the Coco Sing Wildlife Area near Fredericktown, Ohio. He used a rig and pulley system to climb to the top of a 60-foot-tall hollow tree and place the body parts inside. Later, he returned to his home. According to Hoffman's confession, he was tender to Sarah while he kept her captive. He said he gave her a treasure island to pass the time, watched Iron Man and played Wii games with her, cooked her hamburgers, and, horrifyingly, slept with his arm around her. He also admitted to raping her at least once. 
Meanwhile, police were on his trail. Tina Herman's boss had raised the alarm after going to her house and seeing the blood. They first encountered Hoffman on a bike trail near Kenyon College, where they discovered Tina's pickup truck. Later, during Hoffman's confession, he said he intended to retrieve the truck and take it back to the Herman residence before burning down the house. But when police encountered him there, they questioned him. Hoffman told them he was waiting for his girlfriend to get off work at the nearby Kenyon Inn, and they let him go. It wasn't until police found a Walmart bag containing two tarps and a box of heavy-duty 55-gallon bin bags at the murder scene that they began putting the clues together. They went to the shop and found the man who had purchased these items on surveillance. One of the deputies saw what he drove and recognised him as the man they had spoken to a few nights before, near Kenyon College. Footprint analysis at the crime scene indicated that the killer had most likely taken Sarah alive from the house. So, time was of the essence in apprehending Hoffman. On November 14th, just four days after the murder, police raided his home, catching him asleep on his sofa. Police were disturbed on entering the house. It was filled to the brim with leaves. The bathroom was lined with over a hundred bags of them. These bags of leaves were stacked floor to ceiling. In the bathroom, they even covered the mirror, just leaving the sink and toilet exposed. I would highly recommend looking up pictures of this crime scene on Google and having a look for yourselves. After looking at the crime scene photos, the house looks very similar to a hoarder's house, just absolutely filled and in the strangest of places were these bags of leaves. Some of the piles were so high that police feared that the bodies were hidden underneath them, but they found nothing. When police did a more detailed search, they found that bizarrely, the freezer contained only two dead squirrels and some red ice popsicles or ice creams as they made their way downstairs. They found the basement door had been barricaded with a sewing cabinet when they entered their room, they found Sarah alive. She was found lying, bound on a bed of leaves, while wearing what reports described as a white plastic bag that had holes cut out for her legs. Sarah also told police that Matthew had cut her finger with a knife. She told police that he usually left her gagged, and that he said to her he was planning to release her before Christmas. Hoffman said that he'd made this bed out of leaves, and he said that Sarah liked it. It was extremely comfy, and he even wanted to sleep on it. Unaware that Hoffman had killed her mother and brother, Sarah told investigators that she was worried that Hoffman had killed her dog. Hoffman later admitted that he did indeed kill the dog, because it wouldn't stop barking at him. Documents released after the court case revealed that police had hours of taped conversation, during which Hoffman said nearly nothing. He later said he had a nightmare that prompted him to confess. He described a dream to an investigator where he was in a food processing plant. He opened a bin bag and saw body parts inside, which made him develop a knot in his stomach and made the memories of the murders come flooding back. He asked the same investigator to let him write up the locations of the bodies on a piece of paper before shooting him in a faked escape attempt. He shut down for another two days before finally giving them the location of the bodies. On January 6, 2011, he pleaded guilty to 10 separate felony charges, including aggravated murder and rape. He was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. After Sarah was reunited with her father, Larry Maynard, 
He said he had read the confession and does not believe that Hoffman took care of her. He believes that the narrative is self-serving and an attempt to continue to control the situation from behind bars. He also said that his daughter has returned to school and is working with a therapist to hopefully overcome this trauma. Sarah has gone on to write a book sharing her experiences. The book is called The Girl in the Leaves. Wow, what a crazy case, right? I heard about this whole story through the Generation Y podcast and I was so shocked by it. As someone who listens to a lot of true crime content and YouTube videos and stuff like that, I was really surprised that I'd never heard about this case before. So I'm happy to be sharing this case with you to, you know, spread some more awareness about what happened and these tragic murders and the horrific kidnapping and and trauma that happened to Sarah. I want to thank you all for listening to my second episode. I actually have a request for next week's episode, so I better start working on it. If you have any cases that you would like me to cover, please send me a message on my Instagram. My handle is something.dark.podcast. I will talk to you guys next week. Thank you.